fixed, a 12-bit fixed point value, or right, as opposed to floating point. So you don't have to worry about um, the occasional inaccuracies that come up in floating point. The disadvantage is that it doesn't necessarily have the same range. Anyway, basically, this is like a decimal number that's you know going to be good for precision. Um, so this over here, this is a helper function that takes the main texture, right? This is the image, and then feeds in a texture coordinate and then returns the color of the pixel at that particular place. Depending on what your settings are in your texture, um, for um, uh, the filter mode, sometimes it'll blend between two pixels in your image and do different things like that. But ultimately, we're gonna get you know something here, which in this, our case of our image is gonna be, well, it's always gonna be white, but it's gonna have a certain amount of transparency depending on how close to the middle it is, and it's gonna fall off to more transparent on the outside. So we're gonna get some sort of thing. Fixed four is gonna look something like, um, it's always white, right, like this with some default alpha value. So maybe, you know, quarter alpha or something like that. So mostly transparent. It's gonna look something like this. Um, and this is gonna be the color. And then again, we're gonna ignore the fog code, but we're gonna leave it in. And then it returns this as the color of the pixel to draw in this particular spot. So what we wanna do is we wanna mo modify this alpha thing, okay? Whatever that alpha is, we want it to be even more transparent the further away it is from the camera. So we want some sort of like, some sort of float or whatever that represents the distance alpha, okay, which has some kind of value, some sort of value. And what we're gonna do for our color, the alpha of the color, we're gonna take that alpha and multiply it by our distance alpha. So as our distance alpha drops down to zero, the final color will also go down to zero. So they'll multiply with each other and become more and more transparent the further away from the screen we are. That's great. So how do we get the alpha from here? to in here. Well, the information that gets passed between the two is this V2F structure, right? We output it here and we input it over here. So what we need is some extra information in there, in this structure, which we can do. Now, there are funky kind of rules involving what kind of information get put in there and structure and things like that, which we won't get into. Uh, you can look it up more, but what's very nice is by default, there's actually an expectation that normally it's entirely reasonable for you to pass color between the vector shader or the vertex, the vertex shader, I should say, and the fragment shader, okay? And that's because it's actually possible for you to assign a color to a vertex. There's all sorts of different applications for colorizing your vertices themselves. Usually, in most applications, your colors, whoops, your colors don't have, um, vertex in, or sorry, your vertices don't have any color information. You get all your color based on the texture, the UV coordinates, and then lighting information and shadows and stuff like that. But you can add a color to every vertex. You can say, ah, this point in the mesh is red and this point over here is green, and then that will get multiplied later on. So it's very natural for you to have color information in this V2F um, struct. And then we're gonna take advantage of that. Basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set our, um, our output.color we're going to set it, this is going to be a fixed four. So we're sort of defining a new fixed four here, but note, you don't use the, 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 the word new, okay? It's going to be white, but the alpha is going to be this code over here. I'm going to cut this and paste it in there. And then I'm going to get rid of this. Again, we're not going to create a new um, placeholder variable, even though often I would quite enjoy that. So we're going to do this. So we're defining the color of the vertices as pure white, but with an alpha that falls off with distance over here. And then over in our fragment part, then we have that. So this distance alpha, we're going to get rid of that mention. We don't need it because i.color.alpha is there. Now, I could just operate on the alpha like this, but it's probably a lot better if I just say, listen, the color is going to be the color multiplied by the vertex color over here. And in fact, I can save a little bit of this step over here if I just say this. So now the color that we get from the fragment function is gonna be multiplied into our regular stuff. Now, all this part, all the actual colors, the red, green, and blue is just set to one. So we're gonna be multiplying whatever color comes in here by one. So it's gonna be unchanged. Although if we wanted to tint stuff, we certainly could. But the alpha is gonna change with distance over here. So. Let's go and flip back over into Unity. And we got no comp compilation errors, which is nice because shaders are kind of a pain in the ass to like debug from the compilation errors. They can be a little tricksy. Um, so that's good. Our material, 
uh, sorry, that's our texture. Our material over here is using our space dust texture. Notice that we're all fine here. If we had made a mistake, right? If I had made some sort of error, um, like, I don't know, tried to use something that didn't exist yet, right? Over here, then I switched into Unity. We would get that that pinkish purpley color, that magenta color, which shows an invalid shader, and we'd actually get an error listed over here, undeclared identifier. Oh, okay. We've got some sort of typo we've got to fix, so you're going to sort that out. So if your um, your sphere ends up being completely pink, it's because your shader didn't compile. But here we're back to good. Excellent. Let's hit play. And what should happen now, especially if I set it to maximize on play, the dust that is further away is going to be more transparent. And more, more notably, as we look at, look at that little dust mode, right? It's fading out. Ooh. And then it becomes fully clearly white, well, as much as the texture allows, when it gets right on top of our camera. But now things are fading in, so they're not jumping in, and then they're fading out over there. Um, hmm. So this is actually fading in and out linearly with distance. What you could also do is have it like, so if it's within 20 units of your camera, have it be fully lit, and then the last five only do the fallout there. But actually, I think I'm quite content with this. It's also probably, um, we can make it more evident, I think. If we make a dust field like really insane, like a thousand dust motes now and do something like that. Yeah, see, that's looking quite a bit better, I think. Excellent. Okay, but here's the one problem that we've got going on here. Our distance is currently hard-coded in, right? We've got our distance hard-coded in over there, which is really, really, really not what we want. What we want to be able to do is, well, I mean, first of all, it should probably be in some kind of variable, which makes it more clear, but ideally, we would like to be able to say, listen, on our material, so not on our shader over here, but the actual instance of the material, matte space dust, we've got the ability to change the texture over here. Wouldn't it be nice if we also had the ability to type in the fallout distance? Well, we can do that. So in our inspector over here, I can define something using the same sort of thing. I'm going to call this fall off distance, okay? So that's going to be the internal label for some sorcery we're going to see in a minute. Then uh, we're going to define, this is just going to be the label. So we're going to call this, I don't know, fall off distance. That sounds pretty good. And it is not, this 2D represents the fact that it's a two-dimensional texture. For us, it's just going to be, um, I can just say float. Oh, I may be misremembering here. It's entirely possible. I may have to verify. Um, uh, Unity shader properties, because I'm worried that I'm lying to you about... Oh, it's capital F. I'm like, no, there's something. There's something different. Okay, capital F over here is great. And we're, we'll set a default value, like something like, say, 25. Okay, I think if we do this, our shader should compile. Excellent. And now you can see, actually, in our inspector, right away, it's got a fallout distance we can put in here. So we can say, we can change it to something like 5. Excellent. But, of course, if I hit play, it's not being used right now. Right? It's in the inspector, that's great, but we still have the hard coded in value of 25. So, okay, how do we get this here? Well, what we have to do, and this is, and this is a little bit odd, these properties here can never be ref referenced directly in your CG program. This is the actual program over here. And you can actually see an example of this. For example, here's the main texture, right? This is what accepts our image, the main texture here. Notice how it's called underscore main text. And if we scroll down into our shader program, you can see right here, sampler 2D main text. This is the actual data. This is the actual variable that holds the texture in our code. And because this has the same name as this property, Unity auto magically connects the two for us. So this is what we need to exist. So we can't access fall off distance directly. If I went and grabbed this and put it right here, and went into Unity, we would get an error. It doesn't know what fall off distance is. But if I say, um, our program is going to have a float called fall off distance in it, like this. Now I've declared this within our program, and Unity will auto magically connect this variable to this property. So now when I go back over, now I don't get an error, and I can tweak this distance. We actually get it in the preview a little bit, which is quite cool. So let's say we set it to, yeah, five or whatever. Now run the program. Now the dust particles, they only show up right on top of the camera, actually. Ooh, look at that. 
right? They fade off quite quickly. This is obviously no good. Uh, what's nice is I can actually change the value at runtime as well. Ooh, huh? Cool stuff, right? This is also very quick. Um, much better than trying to calculate things inside of a Unity script, which is pretty good. Of course, if I put the fallout distance significantly over 25, then we'll go back to having that pop-in effect again. So really what we want is we would like this falloff distance. We definitely wouldn't want it to be bigger than the dust cloud's radius, because then you get pop-in again, which is no good. Um, you could, in theory, have it be smaller than the dust cloud distance, but then kind of silly and you don't want to have to manage this what we want to do is really we want to have the fallout distance to be the same as the actual dust field radius because that that makes sense right so okay so now we have to remember every time we change the cloud radius over here i have to remember to go and change in my shader this fall off distance does that sound like fun no i don't think it does at all at all so what we would much rather have it do is have the dust field, which is where we set the cloud distance, wouldn't it be great if it also set the fallout distance correctly for our, um, for our dust field? Is that possible? Yeah, it is actually. Let's open our dust field script. So this thing at start is responsible for um, instantiating a whole bunch of copies of the prefab, okay? But what's interesting is that each one of these dust motes has a, um, has a mesh renderer on it, right? So the dustmost prefab, we can actually take a look at that in our inspector. <laughs> do, do, do. Dustmote prefab over here. It's got, on its actual graphic object over here, it has a mesh renderer, and the mesh renderer is what has the reference to the material. So if on our prefab, we say something like, um, on the maybe on the transform, get component in children mesh renderer. Okay, so we do this. So mesh renderer MR is this. So this is the mesh renderer. And this me mesh renderer has a material. In fact, it has a few things going on with material. It has material, materials, shared material, shared materials. What's the deal here? Well, first of all, it's worth noting that your mesh renderer can have multiple materials on it, right? So there, this is now a mesh renderer that has 10 materials registered to it. And your actual mesh could have multiple material indis indices and different things like this. So this is why there is a materials and, or, and a shared materials property on your mesh renderer. Material and shared material is simply a shortcut to the first one. So saying mesh renderer dot material is the exact same thing as saying mesh renderer dot materials zero. Literally exactly the same thing. So for our purposes, um, we know on our space dust, we're just going to have a single material on it. So we can just use that. So then what's the difference between material and shared material? Well, at first, there is no difference, which is kind of interesting. Okay, we have a single material called matte space dust in our code over here, matte space dust. So this is the material and by default, both of these, whether we're talking about dot material or shared material, point to exactly the same instance. The interesting thing is this. If you make a change to shared material, it will change every object that uses that material because you're changing that one master material that they're all pointing to. But if you make a change to material, actually, you can't make a change to it directly. What you always have to do is something like this. You always have to say uh, material, uh, mat is equal to this, then you're going to make a change to material, like set the color to, you know, color dot, I don't know, blue or whatever, something like this. And then just like, just like how you make changes to vertices, then you say, um, the mesh render dot material is equal to this material, right? If you do something like this, then what this means is the, this object here, the one that you're, you're playing with right now, the, the object that has this mesh renderer, it is no longer going to be linked to the shared material. you broken that link and you're pointing to an individual unique instance of that material. So you can make changes to a object by object basis by messing around with the dot material property of the mesh renderer. But that's not what we want to do here. We actually really don't want the dust to each have its own copy of the material because again, you lose tons of optimization opportunities if you do that. But what we can do is we can mess with the shared material between all of them. So that's what we're going to do. So this is the, the matte dust field 
or what do I call it? Doesn't matter what I what I call it in code, but uh, matte space dust. That's what I called it. Okay, this is the matte space dust, and I'm making sure to grab a copy of a shared material at this point, and that's gonna, we're going to make a change to it. What change are we going to do? Well, you have the opportunity to make changes to the properties. So these get and and set options over here. They let you set a variety of properties. There's some helper ones for it, but what we're doing is we're gonna be setting a float, right? We're setting a float for a property. There's two variants of it. You can use an, the ID of the property, numeric ID, or the name. Well, hey, we've got the name. We know that our property is called, what's it called again? It's called, oh, fall off distance. And specifically, we wanna make sure the spelling is the same as this part over here. It's not the label. The label can be whatever. It's this property that we care about. So fall off distance, we're gonna make sure we've got that. So we're gonna set the float fallout distance to be exactly set to our cloud radius. This is gonna happen at the program start. So we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna write back to the shared material. I think we have to do that. Actually, that's a good question. We must have to. Just for the sake of argument, I'm not gonna. I'm pretty sure this won't work, but let's see. So let's verify a few things. Our, um, our matte space dust, we're gonna give it a fallout distance of one. Okay, which is completely useless. We won't see anything with a fallout distance of one. It's terrible. But our dust field is still gonna have, it's actually got a cloud radius of 50. So let's hit play and notice that our dust works. And actually, if we click on the matte space dust over here, you can see the fallout distance has changed to 50 because of that. That's fantastic. Okay, so I didn't have to write it back. Excellent, right, because I'm just grabbing the instance of the shared material, that's fine. So let's make another test on our dust field. Let's set, say the cloud radius is 25 again. Hit play. There we go, 25. And the fallout seems to be working correctly. If we take a look at matte space dust, you can see the fallout distance has been set to 25. So now they're nicely in sync. Actually, I really like that at, at 25. Out of curiosity, what would it look like at 100? Especially with like a thousand dust motes here and 100 distance. might be even more of an appealing effect. I don't know, let's leave it at 50. But there we go, so now we have a nice system by which we have this custom shader where things fall off a distance, we eliminate the pop-in. Also, it makes it a little bit more clear that things far away are dimmer. I kind of like that. I think that's actually much, much more appealing. I think it's much better than our my initial plan of having it be like solid white until you get close to the fall off and then like sort of falling off suddenly. I think this is just much smoother and slicker and gives you a better sense of, of distance going on. I think this looks fantastic. Let me full screen this so you guys can see a little bit better. Of course, you'll be able to try see it on your own screen. Yeah, I think that's quite good. And there we go. So very simple shader. It's unlit, but we've actually learned a lot about the shader stuff, looking at that stuff. There's a lot of information in that that you can potentially apply to various purposes. Um, and our dust field feels fantastic. I'm loving it. Anyway, so that's that. Uh, thank you very much for watching another episode. I know it was a long one. We dealt with a lot of complicated stuff. Hopefully, the explanations are um, were, were useful to you. Uh, I mean, we didn't write a lot of code, but we had to deal with a lot of, like, crunchy stuff. Shaders are very much, for me, still very, like, deep mojo, black magic kind of stuff. Um, I'm always having to re refer to the manual for exact, um, like, formatting, exact spelling of different things, like, oh, what what are the data types called exactly? Because I don't write a lot of shader code. As a result, I'm like, what, what how does this work? What's the exact syntax? Um, so we've got this sort of function going off over here. So really what we're doing, um, it's worth noting, we're making use of vertex colors over here to get this transparency to cycle through, which is kind of neat. And actually, it's not the entire particle that fades out based on the particle's distance from the camera. It's each vertice fades out based on its distance from the camera. In the case of dust mode, it's so small and the vertices are so close together that it will be indistinguishable. But you could actually do something with a larger object that's you know more complex, has a lot of vertices. And with this code, the whole of the object is going to fade out. Well, not, not as a group. The part of the object that's close to the camera will be fully opaque, and the part of the object that's very far from the camera will fade away into... It'll actually look a little bit like fog, which is kind of interesting. So you can do some funky tricks just with something as simple as this, which is kind of fun. Um, so there you have it. Uh, and even if you wanted to, you could always add another property over here uh, for the actual color. Use that as the base of your color and then just modify the alpha for the fall off or do something like that. So anyway, there you have it, folks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. 
Thank you, October patrons. Those are the people who pledged in October and who are supporting these videos from November through to early December, and especially these mic check supporters. We've got Yuko Finn, Adam Conway, Drazian, Jan Torivel, Adjective, Michael McClintock, Aaron Toyson, Craig Mortel, Stephen Wendell, Julien Auger Lafont, Marius Fielvold, Speedy Savant, Valiant Cake Fiend, Wes Oldenboiving, Jason Yanity, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey Milner, and absolutely everyone who watches, shares, favorites, and subscribes to these videos. Thank you very, very much.